garden. Yeah. And in 2021, Earthworks actually came and redid all of our hardscaping and our fencing around our pond there. They also added in a few plants, which was very nice. And then this year, you guys gave us a grant to really work on redoing our courtyard. So the reason we asked for your grant was really to do more education. Um, we have a lot of guests that go through and they are all local to Jacksonville for the most part. We do get people from out of state. We have had a few people from out of the country, which has been very interesting to meet. Um, but we found out through educating, a lot of our native citizens have no idea about our native wildlife. So we wanted to incorporate that in our garden, showcase some of those native plants and bring in educators and other ways of connecting with the community to learn more about it. Maybe, Maybe not. not. Anarchy? Yeah. I think you have to clear that notification box. Is it the notification? No. Wonderful. So I am a natural science person, not a person. <laughs> I'm going to admit that right off the bat. That's pretty obvious. Um, so you all gave us a $500 grant. And for the most part, we spent that on getting flowers, native wildlife, native plants out there. But we did also use it to incorporate some ecological signage. Um, so Mosh agreed to match Ixia's grant. And we were able to get two very large signs that are going to be redone in our courtyard and really feature more of the ecology of plants. Yeah, yeah, it was supposed to be ready months ago. Unfortunately, we have run into a snafu with the people producing our signs, and it is still on back order. So eventually they will come in, but for right now, we're still waiting on those. But as you can see, some of the grant did go to a couple other things. One of those was a composter. We're trying to get away from chemicals and help educate our public a little bit more on alternatives to that. And, and part, part of that was trying to find a more natural fertilizer to help use in our garden and to educate with. So we do have a composter set up, very basic composter, nothing fancy. We were trying to get um, one that was a worm composter. Unfortunately, the one we were looking at disappeared from the world by the time we were able to purchase it. So we did have to compromise on that. Uh, we did spend a good portion on soil, a little bit there. The courtyard soil needed a little bit of help in some areas, so that did go pretty far for us. Uh, we also used pine mulch, excuse me, pine straw in our garden and not cypress mulch as our initial uh, grant application stated we would use. As we learned, it is not the most sustainable. So thank you all. We did switch just to pine straw out in our courtyard for that. It's working very nicely. Uh, and the last thing we did was some little specimen ID signs. So they are Weatherproof signs that we have out in front of all of the native plants, so guests do not have to have us present for them to understand what they're looking at. It's been very helpful for us. So here's a little sample of our guest engagement. We are working on getting our staffing up. Our education team is almost fully staffed now, and my department is fully staffed. Yay! So the education that we've really been pushing right now is admission for walkthroughs in our garden. And as you can see, we've had about 16,000 people come through MOSH just in the few months we had the garden installed. Um, so lots of people have been able to see the native plants of Florida. We're excited about that. We have a couple field trip programs in progress of being made and rolled out for educating a lot of our schools. They can come and take these field trips and have a few focus just on plants. And we do do some really fun crash courses where one of our naturalists, Ren, right here hiding in the corner, has been doing cute little short videos about some of the native plants and highlighting them, highlighting historic uses, what they're used for, what they look like. Uh, and it's been actually very popular and pretty positively received. So we are very, very grateful we've had this opportunity. And this is my favorite thing. We were really, really able to isolate out plants that you could find right here in Duval. Um, as you can see, we added quite a few plants in. Uh, pretty much the only ones we had before this was, let me find it on there. 
Oh, you didn't include those on there. I apologize. So these were all plants we added with the grant. And as you can see before the grant, this is kind of what our courtyard looked like. It's a little bare. Um, we did have a pond. It was lovely. And we didn't have the best breakdown of plants. Pretty much everything in the garden is kunti or cabbage palm of some type. Uh, and not a lot of them were actually native. We did have 10 species you could find right here in Duval, but we actually had a couple species that aren't even in Florida inside this garden. And now almost 100% of our plants are native to Florida. We're super excited about that. And we've really upped the number of species you can find in Duval. I know, we're very grateful. So here's a little bit of that patch there. Uh, we do have some of that bee bomb down on the ground. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, this fire bush is really blocking out that blue porta weed in this photograph, but we are hoping the porta weed is going to be overtaking this corner. Uh, I was not able to remove the fire bush completely, unfortunately. So they're going to have to compete and live together. Strongest one will win. It's going to be the porta weed. Um, and if you look all the way down in the photograph, it's a very narrow garden. So we did have love grass. There's a large scarlet hibiscus hanging out in there as well. Some partridge pea tucked away in that back corner. Um, and we're trying to work on growing those in and revitalizing them. Here's a couple more of the areas that we're working on growing everyone in. We got some of that Dara's blueberry, some of the swamp, swamp sunflower back there, that red salvia, definitely one of my favorites uh, to have that native variety out here. And we also got in our native canna, which is my favorite thing, I'm not going to lie. We had canna indica in the garden before. It is now my greatest bane. So getting in this yellow canna to really showcase this is actually our native flower is definitely my favorite addition to the garden. So as far as plant survival has gone, it's actually been really well. We've only lost one plant and that was our dune sunflower. We had a few days where there was a lot of heavy rain before we got them in the ground and they just did not make it after that. We also had a lot of maypop eaten by Gulf fertility. It is still alive. It has come back for a fourth time now. Um, and we are working on keeping it going. Our partridge pea has already gone out for this year after that cold snap, it just said, nope. But we do have all those seed pods, so we will be having it re-sprout and come back again as an annual. And we're having a little bit of trouble with our rush out in the water area. Our turtles keep knocking our water plants thing directly into the water, so they're getting a little too undated. But we're working that out. And for our future goals, we're still gonna work on removing that can of indica. It is a huge weed in my garden right now and I keep removing it and it keeps sprouting back. Um, so that is my biggest thing. We're also gonna get those ecological signs in as soon as they get off back order. And we are going to continue growing and head starting a lot of our plants and start working on a volunteer docent program. So we will always have someone out in the garden that can help on plant education. So mostly, thank you so much, Ixia, for making this possible for us. We're very grateful. Did you want <laughs> Yes. Yes, we have so many bugs in that garden. Um, we do have a zebra longwing hanging out around the maypop as well. No one has laid caterpillars yet, but I'm waiting. I'm waiting for it. Uh, we do see occasional monarch butterflies. We have several different types of bees and wasps. A couple flies even visit the garden pretty regularly. And we also get dragonflies. There's also a weevil that hangs out on our scarlet hibiscus that I haven't ID'd yet, but it's always in the flower pods. So I want to figure out what it is. Thank you. Are there any other questions? The front of marsh today is too rough. Yes. So <laughs> the front of mosh is not under my discretion, unfortunately. It used to be managed by a local club. Um, that name has been lost to history, however, and no one has been maintaining it for a few years, I just found out. So we're trying to revitalize it, but we have to figure out what to do with the space first. And I don't think it's coming to me. <laughs> When are we planning to move? Uh, we're planning to move in about 2027 um, is when we'll go across the pond. We do have a couple of plans in place to try to keep the garden as a garden. 
Uh, we are doing wildlife surveys right now to document all of the plants and animals that we see visiting our garden in the hopes that we can provide this to whoever ends up developing the property so that they will keep the garden there. Uh, because we have seen quite a few interesting birds, even green herons have come into the Hickson courtyard before. We do have plans to have gardens at the new facility. Um, I still can't talk about too much because I'm not sure what I'm allowed to share, quite honestly, but there are plans in place for several gardens at the new MOSH. All right, well then thank you all so much. Awesome. Okay, our next speaker is Emily Bell, who's the communications coordinator for the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Um, Emily joined the Florida Wildflower Foundation in 2022 as its communications coordinator. And prior to that, she spent four years coordinating invasive species programs with the University of Florida IFAS Extension and for the Florida Invasive Species Partnership. And she began her conservation career as an intern for the Nature Conservancy and went on to work for the Florida Department and Environmental Protection and Hawaii Invasive Species Council. She has over a decade of experience with environmental outreach, planning, and network building. So, well, <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> oh, well, probably help if I put it the right way. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, let me see if I can figure out these buttons real quick. Oh, I think that was the bad button. I pushed the bad button right off the start. I'm sorry, Walter. Which is the advance? Yeah, that's the advance. Got it. That goes back. Thank you. Okay. Um, so as Jody said, I'm with the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Um, and we protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitat through education, research, planting, and conservation. So a lot, the bulk of what we do is education. We have a lot of um, materials available and we, um, are, we grow that uh, every, every day. Um, but we do also have a research committee. And we have grants for planting and other programs as well. Um, as I mentioned, our materials, I have some of them here today. Um, we also have a book, which I, is, I have seven copies of it with me. If anybody's interested, let me know. Um, but our, these materials are available for free. You can download them and print them, or you can order copies for presentations you might be giving, or your garden clubs, or whatever you'd like to do. They're free to our members. We do ask non-members to provide a small fee for shipping. Um, so, and we are um, largely funded by the well, state wildflower license plate. This is our old plate. Um, it was redone to actually represent a na the native Florida Coreopsis. Unfortunately, that first one had the uh, one that's native to Texas. So um, this is our new plate, but um, we are one of the, well, we're a very well-selling plate, which helps fund what we do. We are also are funded by our uh, members and donations. Um, and other sources. So if you don't already have the plate, what's that? No government funding other than the plate. It actually takes an act of legislation to get a license plate. So you could consider that somewhat government funding. So that's my spiel on the foundation. If you'd like to know more, please let me know or check out our website. Um, and I'm here to talk about Northeast Florida's wildflower seasons. So I'm a native Floridian. I grew up on Amelia Island. Um, my dad's on my dad's side of the family we've been here for about three generations and one of my i'm going to call it a pet peeve i guess is when i hear this constant drumbeat of florida has no seasons and i get it you know i don't have a lot of experience with even very far north of us that it's vastly different i understand that um and i understand that as you go further south in florida climactically you really don't have as much change however here in northeast florida we do, one, have uh, temperature change, but we also have very distinct plant seasons. 
And so it kind of almost makes me sad when I hear people say, Florida has no seasons, because I'm like, you don't know what you're missing. It really does. Um, now that said, I have broken this presentation up into kind of the classic seasons, so three months each. There could be some sticklers who consider something more of a summer or, or a fall. Or So I, I'll try to note when things definitely run together. Um, I typically try to uh, put plants in their season when they start blooming. So there certainly are plants that will start blooming in spring and go all the way through late summer. Um, so, and this is by no means comprehensive. This is kind of a, a, almost a personal diary on my behalf. These are the plants kind of I'm most interested that I um, look at the most. And I wanted to touch too, uh, really quickly, just on all of Florida. Um, I'm sure you guys are really familiar with this, but we have over 3000 native plants in the state of Florida. 230 of those are endemic. We've got a few endemics in our own area. Um, 170 of those are wildflowers. And we have a lot of threatened and endangered species as well, including here in Northeast Florida. We are the seventh most botanically diverse state in the contiguous US. Now that ranking, I don't think it's spatially uh, quantified. So like California is huge, Texas is huge, um, and we're under them, but we are a very botanically biodiverse state. So I'm gonna focus, do I have a um, laser on this? Do I have a laser on this? You know? Okay, it's fine. No worries. So I'm going to focus today on Northeast Florida. Um, kind of in this box area, there's a few plants I included that are a little bit of a stretch, but I just love them so much. So I wanted to share them. Um, I spend most of my time in pine flatwoods and uh, sand hills, which as you can see, the pink is the pine flatwoods and the yellow is the sand hills. So you see those are really our predominant habitats anyway. Um, I also, being on Amelia Island, spend a lot of time in the beaches, dunes, and maritime forests. I didn't end up including a lot of coastal plants, though, when I broke it down. So we're going to jump right in, and we're going to start with winter. So as I said, I kind of used the classical uh, breakdown of seasons. So for me, winter in this presentation is kind of December, January, and February. Um, one of the first signs of color up here in North Florida is the Carolina Jessamine, the Gelsium sempervirens. I'm sure you guys are all familiar. I get really excited when it's like January and I'm driving down the roadsides and I see the yellow start popping. I'm like, oh, starting. Um, so that's one of our, our first bloomers. Um, I have very few trees in this presentation, but in winter, we do have a few trees that are blooming. So the top one is the American witch hazel and the bottom is the Florida privet. Uh, these were actually both, uh, these photos were actually, um, are both from Duval County. One was on the hike we did, what's that? The Willie Brown Trail, which is at Teddy Roosevelt, thank you. So the privet was um, from that trail. And then the American Witch Hazel was a part of the um, Pumpkin Hill Complex, the, the Creeks Complex. Let's see, where did we see that? Yeah, the bug tussle, Bogey Creek. Yep, so those are our local. This is one of those ones that's a little bit of a stretch, but I threw it in. Um, another thing that blooms in winter is this spotted wake robin, the Trillium maculatum. So this is a, po a disjunct population that's found in Alachua County. Um, most of it is in the Panhandle, but there are a few populations in northeast, north, central Florida. Um, so if you hit Gainesville in November, December, you can find uh, this trillium in bloom. And then this is the second one that's a bit, I think this is the only other one that's a bit of a stretch. This population is in Putnam County. So I'm considering that still to be slightly north. Um, it's also found in Marion County and then in the Panhandle. Um, this is the large leaf grass of Parnassus. So I take an annual pilgrimage to visit um, the Putnam and Marion County sites, uh, one of which is in Ocala National Forest. And then we get into some of our orchids start blooming in winter as well. So we have the tooth petal false rind orchid, it's a mouthful, and the marsh ladies tress tresses, which is a, a Spiranthes um, species. These are actually nearby as well. These are from the UNF uh, trails. 
which I believe you guys have a field trip to next weekend. And so this is what you are likely to see. These, um, we were, I was talking with Adam and Betsy about these Marsh Ladies Tresses earlier. These are really unique in the Speranthes genus. It's a huge genus. There's lots of species. These are the largest, and they're also an orchid that's almost basically aquatic. They grow in water. They're one of the few, if only, Florida orchids that actually kind of grow in not like deep standing water, but shallow, really damp to somewhat standing, somewhat standing shallow water. And then we start getting our pings, the butterworts, another one of my favorite genuses. So here in Northeast Florida, we have three species of pings that you can find. Um, I call them pings because the genus is Pinguicula. And the first one to pop up, and this is one that kind of edges that winter into spring, um, is the small butterwort, Pinguicula pumula. And this is one of our carnivorous plants. So you can see in the kind of close up of the basil rosette, how those leaves kind of curl in. They're sticky, and when an insect crawls up, they curl in even more, it gets trapped, and they get nutrients as the uh, bug decomposes. Um, this is a really beautiful one. There's a great population of these at Pumpkin Hill. So I, that's often where I go to visit them. And then we transition into spring. So we're gonna continue with our pings. We also have the yellow butterwort and the blue butterwort. There's a great population of yellows on a roadside near Pumpkin Hill. They're probably in the Pumpkin Hill as well, but that's where I have found them. And blue butterworts we see in abundance, both in Cary State Forest and Ralph Simmons State Forest. Um, again, these have larger basil leaves and they are, all the pings have slightly different basil leaves, but it's kind of all the same functionality. They're sticky, they curl up in the insects. And then we get into our colorful orchids. So we have a number of Calipogon species in Florida. Um, and at Cary State Forest, you can actually see all of them. So, but they aren't exclusive to Cary. Um, the first ones that pop up that we start to see are the bearded grass pinks. That's this bottom corner, Calipogon barbatus. And then we start to get into the pale grass pinks, the Calipogon pallidus. The Calipogon mutiflorus, the mini flowered grass pink, is probably somewhere in between. That one you really only see right after fire. So that was actually, um, I really feel really honored to have gotten to see that. One of the folks who used to work out at Cary kind of gave me and Betsy a tip, like, hey, we just burned and it's blooming. So we like hopped in the car and went out to see it. Um, that's the only time I've seen it. Um, and then you have your tuberous grass pink. So these along the top, um, these are probably the most widespread and abundant. I've seen these on roadsides in Yuli. Um, and I, I included this series because I wanted to show, this was actually, all of these pictures were taken in this, on the same roadside area in Yuli. And it's just so fascinating to me, the diversity of color. I'm not a biological scientist, so I don't know the mechanism. I think it has something to do with the soil. I don't know. But I mean, these are all plants that are really close together, but still have this, you know, pretty drastic uh, variation. I've seen this as well in the pallidus, the Calipogon pallidus out at Cary along the um, power line. It doesn't get, I don't think, quite as bright, but you do see kind of, this is a really pale one. I'd say a lot of the pallidus we see are more towards that last pinkish uh, grass, uh, tuberous grass pink. Um, so yeah, it's really cool that we have a forest where you can see basically all of Florida's uh, grass pinks. Some other really beautiful orchids. And again, um, for the rosebud and fragrant begonia, the Cleistesiopsis. I usually uh, give this caveat when I first start giving presentations, I butcher Latin but I think it's very important to know the Latin, so I always include it. Um, you can also see both of these two species at Cary. The first one, the um, Diverticata, is uh, smaller, so you can kind of see them next to each other and you can tell the difference because it's significantly smaller than the fragrant pagonia. The snake mouth orchid is another really cool one. Um, we see it both Cary and Ralph Simmons, and it's, it's beyond those spots. Those are just places I go a lot. Um, and it always confuses me because this middle one is called Pagonia in the common name, but the snake mouth orchids genus is Pagonia. 
whatever those naming people are doing, that's up to them. Um, but this one is a, it's very small. It's got a very small flower, um, very delicate and beautiful. And then of course, the classic sign of spring for Northeast Florida is our rhododendron, the Pinkster azalea. Um, you can find this in a lot of flatwoods across Northeast Florida and you can smell it and it's sweet. And um, yes, just one of our very classic Southern signs of spring. And then the lupines start hitting. And yes, I have them in spring. I will note that the sky blue lupine was kind of on that line between winter and spring. That's one of the first ones that starts popping. So I've seen that in February. And so my spring is March, April, May, but I have seen sky blue in February as well. Um, the lady lupine is kind of the next one. Uh, there's pretty good populations of that at both Julington Durbin and Ralph Simmons. We see that one at Ralph Simmons, right, Betsy? Thank you. Okay, Carrie. Okay, cool. Um, and then the sundial. The sundial is one, and I, I keep practicing Betsy. She's kind of my partner in traveling around Northeast Florida to see plants. Um, she and I spent a lot of time sleuthing this one out in the past spring. Um, we found it in Jennings State Forest and also in Julington Durban. And it's a little, it blooms a little bit later, but its um, leaves are very different. So you can really, we found it before it started blooming because you can, you know, you have to look pretty close, but you can tell it has a very distinctive leaf shape, um, especially compared to the other two. But it is also kind of much smaller. Um, in general, it's, you could say it's a little le less robust, although some of the plants do get larger and spread, but flower size and leaf size is a little smaller than the other two. Asimina, our pawpaws. This is one of another one. I keep, they're all my favorite, right? <laughs> this is another one of my favorite genuses. And there are many species of pawpaw in Florida. Um, I honestly cannot tell them all apart. Sometimes just by your location, you can know which is which because they are kind of very geographically distinct, some of them. Um, Slimleaf pawpaw isn't really found along the coastal Northeast Florida counties, but right in, in, from them, you will find it. So I see a lot of it in Columbia County, and then even a little further, again, I'm edging out a little bit, but um, Suwannee County, you'll see it as well. Um, let's see, dwarf papa, Asimina pygmaea. Um, that one is, you'll see that one around quite a bit. It grows quite shorter, hence the common name, the dwarf papa, um, and its flowers are pretty small. The small flower papa is, we have populations of that in Nassau County. So we see that at Fort Clinch State Park. Um, I'm sure it's in Duval County too. Um, and it has just these really tiny flowers um, and kind of larger leaves, but sometimes you'll see the flowers before it's really grown its leaves back. Um, and then the woolly papa is my favorite papa. It has these really uh, velvety soft leaves and it puts on these big, lovely creamy white flowers and it just goes nuts in the flatwoods. So gosh, at um, Ralph Simmons, I'm trying to think of other places, I think maybe Jennings, Julington Durman. It's, it's a widespread one and it's just, it's really lovely. And of course the pawpaws are the host plant for the zebra swallowtail. So you'll find the caterpillars and also it's really magical when you're in an, a flatwoods that has a lot of pawpaw in the summer because there's just zebra long wings just flitting around everywhere. It's very nice. And then our Saracenias start popping as well. And so here in Northeast Florida, we have two species. There are rumors that Saracenia flava, the yellow top used to occur here, but they're very sketchy and unconfirmed. So we know we have um, Saracenia stichicina, I'm bad at that one too, the parrot pitcher plant. Those are the top two pictures. We know we have hooded pitcher plant, Saracenia minor. That's one of the easiest to see um, in a lot of sites. Uh, Carrie, uh, uh, Ralph, again, the places that I go the most often, but certainly are in Duval and other places. Um, but we also have, uh, pitcher plants are kind of famous for hybridizing. They're just like, if they're growing together, different species, they just, it's a free for all. So we have the hybrid between the parrot and the hooded, which is doesn't have a common name, but it's Saracenia formosa. And that's this little guy here. And you can kind of see how he has the 
the hood of the miner in a way, but has that kind of belly of the parrot, which you actually can't see in the picture above because they're clustered in some other stuff on the ground, but it's really neat. So you can see this hybrid pretty readily out at um, Ralph Simmons. Milkweeds. I went almost cross-eyed trying to get all my milkweed labels right. And this is where we're gonna transition from spring to summer with our milkweeds because our milkweeds start in the spring and then of course carry us on through summer. So uh, the genus Asclepius, there are 21 native milkweeds to Florida. Um, they're not all in Northeast Florida, but we do have a pretty high diversity here. So starting in spring, some of our first milkweeds to pop out are our few flower, which is up at the top, our green antelope horn, Asclepius viridis, our swamp milkweed, Asclepius perennis, our longleaf milkweed, Asclepius longifolia, and our pine woods milkweed, Asclepius humistrata. So these kind of start busting out. And again, they're going to go and they're going to carry us into June. So we're going to talk about our next set of milkweeds that starts blooming. Um, and we're into summer. So we're going to go June, July, August, kind of. Um, so then we get into our Carolina milkweed, Asclepius cinerea, butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberosa, savanna milkweed, Asclepius pendicillata, velvet leaf milkweed. So I'm down here now, Asclepius tomatosa. Swamp milkweed, Asclepius incarnata, and world milkweed, Asclepius verticillata. A really fantastic place to see a lot of our milkweeds is Julington Durban. Um, I think we have found eight species there in, in one day in like June-ish. Um, so not every one of these, I actually don't think I've seen Savannah milkweed there, but it probably is there. Not sure. Um, but of, of this page, all but the savanna and the swamp are for sure there. Um, let's go back real quick. The humistrata is there as well. The pine woods, no, what are, the longifolia we see on roadsides a lot. Um, but yeah, Julington Dermot is just a fantastic place to, uh, and I didn't include What's the other one that's at Julington Durban? I'm gonna call on Adam for this one. The uh, red one, Amplexicala. So Asclepius Amplexicalis is also actually at Julington Durban. It's a bright red flower. Um, I've only managed to catch it like at the end of its bloom. And so I have a few kind of sad pictures of it, but that is also another one. And then I saved my favorite for last, um, the large flower milkweed Asclepius canivens. I see a lot of this at Cary on the power line. And I just think it's so cool because those flowers really are so big and it has a very long bloom time. So I was, I actually really didn't pay attention until this year. Um, it starts blooming pretty early and it's still blooming through late summer. And now we're gonna go into another round of orchids. So our summer orchids, we start seeing the Platantheras. Our Platanthera nivea is our snowy and our yellow crested orchid, Platanthera castata. There's a few other yellow orchids. There's the Chapman eyes, which I do believe is found in Nassau County. Um, it's rarer, uh, but this Cristata um, I see on roadsides in Nassau County. And um, there's a good patch of it in Cary as well. And that's also where I see the nivea most prevalently. Again, these aren't the only places these plants are. They're just the places I go the most often. And then as the rhododendron is a harbinger of spring, for us in Florida, the hibiscus is really a harbinger of summer and a, a kind of a classic summer staple. So again, we have a lot of hibiscus, a lot of native hibiscus species. So here we have featured the scarlet hibiscus in the top, the pineland hibiscus, the uh, Malvaceae family, but not hibiscus genus, uh, Virginia salt marshmallow, and I apologize, but I'm not even gonna attempt that genus, um, <laughs> postal zakia. Um, the, coming to the bottom here, we have the swamp mallow, hibiscus grandiflorus, and the crimson eyed rose mallow, hibiscus motiotis. There is a fantastic population of hibiscus grandiflorus in Nassau County on the Egan Street Greenway on Amelia Island. Um, which is where I often go to see it. Uh, a lot of these you'll see on the roadsides. There's a lot of the um, Virginia salt marshmallow on the greenway in, in Fernandina as well. Um, the scarlet hibiscus, I actually, 
I'm sure is in Northeast Florida, but I mostly see it in my own yard where I have it planted. <laughs> um, and then the comfort root, the or pineland hibiscus, that top middle uh, we see at Ralph Simmons for sure. But again, loves a dry, sandy pine flatwood site. Another, you know, really summer staple is our passion flowers. Um, up here we have Passiflora incarnata, which is the large picture, and Passiflora lutea. Um, we see lutea at Fort Clinch State Park in Nassau County regularly, and another uh, Passiflora incarnata is very prevalent on our greenway in Nassau County um, on a May Island as well, but it's one that is abundant in many natural areas across North Florida. And then this is just kind of a hodgepodge of some of the ones I didn't want to leave out. So in the summers, we see the blue sky flower up at the top, tons of rattlesnake master, which is a really cool one. I'm very excited to see rattlesnake master become popular in the native plant nursery trade um, because it's hardy and it adds a really cool structure to your garden. Um, so that's a really neat one. The button bush, of course, the Cephalanthus accidentalis. Um, great for pollinators. This is one that's going to be kind of in a wet, ditchy area. And then kind of going, well, drier sites are going to have the black-eyed Susan and the partridge pea. And then again, another wet ditch plant is going to be your Bartram's rose gentian, which uh, the power line at Cary State Forest typically has a just fantastic uh, Bartram's rose gentian bloom. Um, and it's just the ditches are just radiating bright pink. It's amazing. Um, I will note here that the rose gentian genus Sebacea or Sebadia, um, there's a, that's a really diverse uh, genus as well that I didn't include here. They kind of bloom through summer. Honestly, to a degree, the white ones, I have a hard time IDing, um, but it is a very nice diverse genus as well. Some of the really cool things that pop up in Northeast Florida in the summer are our Barber's Buttons, Marshalia graminifolia, we see these on the roadsides at Cary, Ross Simmons again, and this coastal false asphodel. Actually, I have one roadside site for this, one ditch in Nassau County where I see it the most often. Um, beyond that, again, I'm sure it's in other natural areas, but that's where I tend to visit it each summer. Some of our rare and endangered slash endemics here, um, of course, the Bartram's Ixia, couldn't leave that out. Um, there is a population of these in Jennings State Forest, as well as Julington Durban Creek Preserve. Um, and as you know, these are endemic to Northeast Florida and considered rare and threatened. The night flowering petunia, Ruellia noctiflora, another one that is populations are very limited. Um, and we actually see, again, this is another Nassau County roadside find. So most of the ones I visit each year are just kind of in a ditchy wet roadside area. And they bloom very early in the morning. So you get up early by, if, if it's a sunny day, by around nine o'clock. Actually, same thing with the Bartram Dixia. They have about the same kind of bloom, morning bloom time. And then this Pineland leather root, Oribexalum virgitum. virgitum. Um, this one, Betsy actually discovered again on a roadside in a ditch in Nassau County. Um, and it is a very rare, there's only a handful of known populations of this plant. It is also at Julington Durban Creek Preserve. And then another one of my absolute favorites, and this is where we're gonna kind of start transitioning into fall. So in late summer, we start getting our pine lilies. Um, I actually have noticed that the panhandle, because I on Facebook, I see some, some bloom times on in other parts of the state. And uh, for a lot of things, I see that they get them a little earlier and I'm always so jealous, like, oh, I just haven't started yet. I'm chomping at the bit. Um, there's a really great population of pine lilies, again, out at Cary, um, but also at Ralph Simmons and in many other places. Um, this is the largest lily in Florida, native lily in Florida, and it's just fantastic. I mean, come on, just beautiful. So it's really fun to go out and uh, visit these guys each year. And then we're gonna transition into fall, our last season. Uh, so fall for me, September, October, November. And of course the classic colors of fall in Florida, fall flowers in Florida are purple and yellow. So kicking it off with our liatris and those yellow uh, glowy lights in the background are our silk grass, our pityopsis. So I'm gonna start with our purples and 
uh, highlight a few of our more abundantly atrous species. Uh, the top picture is pink scale gay feather, and the lower one is Leatra spicata, dense gay feather. And these put on just fantastic roadside displays. So Austin Lee, uh, honestly, most of my Leatris and a lot of my Carpeferous blooming, which we're gonna look at in a minute, are roadsides. Um, cruising, there's some fantastic roadsides in uh, Duval, Nassau, Baker, in the fall, it's fabulous. Um, and then our Carpheferous. So Carpheferous has been moved by some into the genus Trilissa. So I'm still using Carpheferous here. If you consult the um, Florida Plant Atlas, they still have Carpheferous as the primary name, although they do it like you can find it by Trilissa. Um, so I just, if there's anyone who has made the transition to Trilissa, I wanted to at least mention it, but I'm still calling it Carpheferous, partly because it's one of the funnest ones to say. Um, so Harry Chaffhead, the Carpheferous paniculatus, again, just putting on a stunning roadside display. Vanilla leaf, this is another one similar to the azalea that you can almost smell before you see. It um, really creates this lovely vanilla scent in the pine flatwoods, Carpheferous odoratissimus. The transition to Trilissa name is actually Trilissa odoratissima. So if you, again, if you have gone to that new nomenclature, um, and then our other Carpheferous, the Florida Paintbrush. I actually think this one didn't get moved to Trilissa. I think this one they actually kept in Carpheferous, um, Corymbosis, and just the butterflies on this, wild. Um, let me think, Pumpkin Hill, this year had an incredible uh, Florida paint Paintbrush display. The Flatwoods and Ralph Simmons as well are always good for this plant. And then we'll get into our yellows. So our goldenrods, of course, our solidagos. And I always have to give my little solidago PSA. It is not the goldenrod that causes your allergies. It is the ragweed. They bloom at the same time. So don't blame our beautiful um, and important pollinator plant, nectar pollinator plant. Um, so here we have the Chapman's goldenrod and the seaside goldenrod, which are two that are really prevalent in our area. Our sunflowers, helianthus, that's another, we've got tons of helianthus in Florida. The helianthus and gustifolius are really the ones that put on those really fantastic roadside displays. Also, if you've seen in central Florida, some of the pictures where they just grow out into these um, wet areas, these flat wet areas and just fill it up. They had like a super bloom in central Florida this year. Um, I don't know of any sites in Northeast Florida where we get that same type of bloom, but we certainly have roadsides that put on a nice display of it. And I saw someone back there giving the height. These things get taller than you. Um, so there were a lot of great photo ops in Central Florida of people out in the sunflowers. Um, this guy on the side, this is actually my favorite helianthus and I think an often overlooked one because if you're just driving by at 60 miles an hour, it looks like dead flower heads. But if you stop and take a closer look, it actually is this really beautiful maroonish color when it's in peak bloom. Sometimes they do actually put on a reduced flower, little petal. So that's this bottom picture. You can see one that actually has a few little petals, um, but it's more classically that middle picture. And then last year on roadsides in Nassau County, I found a few of these fully yellow ones, which I thought was amazing. Um, but that's, I've only seen them in one place um, in Nassau County on a roadside. The first time I ever saw these, I knew about the plant before I actually saw it. And I think I was in Osceola State Forest maybe. Anyways, I was cruising with a friend and I wasn't driving. So I was looking out the roadside and I saw them and I just screamed, you and I was so excited and got out. And, but this is one of those that you really have to take a close look at because when you get up close, it's so stunning. And the amount of like little critters you'll find on it. You see a lot of mobs kind of hiding underneath the little flower heads. Um, a lot of small bees and flies like these guys as well. Balduina is another really interesting genus. There's three species of Balduina. Um, they're basically endemic to the Southeast coastal plain. This one, Balduina atopurpurea, is an endemic to Northeast Florida. And there's only like seven or 10 known populations of this plant. So there is some at Cary, there's some at Ralph Simmons. Yes. 
Um, and it's just a neat little plant. I don't know if anybody remembers that show Rugrats, but there was like the older girl who had the hair, the three. It always reminds me of that for some reason, um, the way the petals uh, radiate out. So we have this purple disc honeycomb head, only gonna find, only place in the world we're gonna find it is here in Northeast Florida. The one flower honeycomb head, which is that last picture down in the corner, it looks very similar. It just has, its center is yellow and it grows in a very similar way with just kind of a singular stalk with a single flower head on top. The other Balduina, coastal plain, I'm blanking on the species name, and Gustafolia um, is more west of us. We don't really get it in our area, but it is also kind of a more robust, it has flower heads that branch and you get, uh, and it has uh, more abundant leaves on the petals as well. You can see here, these single stalks have super reduced leaves. So the Balduina, Balduina and Gustafolia, which we don't really see, um, is quite distinct from these two. Uh, this is just celebrating another kind of favorite of mine, the Hopness, the Apios Americana. Other common names for this and potentially more popular common names are groundnut. Um, Hopness is just so lovely. Fun to say. So we're trying to, Betsy and I are trying to make that the staple common name for this plant, aside from groundnut. But it is called groundnut because it has these little ground tubers that you can dig up and cook and they're kind of potato-y, but they're very small, like a small fingerling potato. You can also eat the flower buds. Um, and this is a vine. So it grows kind of in a forest woodland edge. You will find the Apios Americana. We see this in Nassau County, again, on the Greenway. Um, this one is widespread. It goes all the way up the East Coast, um, probably into the central US as well. And this was a famine food for our early settlers in Virginia. That's where they landed, right? First thing, Virginia. So this was uh, a source of sustenance for early settlers. We have, continuing with our orchid theme, we have a few of our later bloomers. The white fringed orchid, I uh, see I left a hashtag in my names, um, this is another Platanthera. That's a little bit of a later bloomer. This one is kind of on the edge of summer and fall. So it's a tricky on where to put it. Um, but we see this one, the only site I've seen it is again, Ralph Simmons. Um, and it's really neat. It has those super long, uh, lips on them. And then the green fly orchid. This is one of our few um, epiphytic orchids we have up in Northeast Florida. As you go south, of course, they have all of that really cool epiphytic orchid diversity. Um, up here, we've got the terrestrial orchids covered, but not so much the epiphytes. But if you look up in your oak trees this time of year, yes, this time of year, you can find um, the green fly orchid. And then the summer farewell, aptly named as it comes into bloom in abundance. Uh, in late summer and into early fall, and a pollinator nectar plant if there ever was one. Um, I've been out at, on the kind of dry sand hills of Ralph Simmons when this is in full bloom, in like a super bloom year where it's just like a sea of this summer farewell, uh, summer farewell, Dahlia pinnata, and just butterflies and bees going gangsters, just so amazing. The diversity of pollinators that enjoy this late summer, early fall treat. And that may be, oh, one more. Uh, it may be the day after Halloween, but I had to sneak a spooky one in here. Um, the ghost pipes, the monotropa uniflora. So these start popping up, at least for us, um, late October, early November. Um, I visit these both in Fort Clinch and on Little Talbot Island State Park. But again, I'm sure they're in other places. A really fascinating thing about these plants that you would never guess is they're actually in the blueberry family. Um, very distantly related, I guess, whoever does that taxonomy. But um, I'm blanking on the family name. Can you spot me that? Eric Casey, thank you. So um, these are, you can see they lack chlorophyll. So they get nutrients from other plants. They're kind of parasitic. They are connected to the fungal network in the soil. Um, so you'll find these under oak trees in the leaf litter. Um, 
And you can see they kind of start coming up droopy and then they get tall. You do have some that are pinkish and some that are almost pure white. Um, really neat. So I think that is my virtual tour of North Florida's wildflowers. Again, not comprehensive. Um, I did leave out, I, I should have noted this in spring. I did leave out our vexiniums. There's a ton of those as well, our, our other blueberries. I, again, those are ones that I find extremely difficult to ID. I can look at it and say, yeah, it's a vaccinium. But um, so those weren't in there. There's a, a few other big ones, but um, I tried to hit, you know, the ones that especially we really identify with in the seasons throughout Northeast Florida. So thank you so much again for having me. And um, if you want to learn more about the foundation, check out our website. If you have any questions about the foundation, you can contact us at info at flawildflowers.org. Um, if you want to follow my photography and flower adventures, you can follow me on Instagram at Emily Bell Photo. Um, you will see dogs and the occasional kid, but it's mostly nature and mostly plants. Throw some birds and herps in there sometimes too, but um, I'll, yeah, questions. Thank you. Ah, so the question is uh, about my camera and what I use. I'm a very lazy photographer who married a professional photographer. So when I first started taking pictures and sharing them, I just used my iPhone. Um, I now have a Sony, I use the A2. Um, it's not a DSLR or anything. It's a, a, you can, it has a program mode that does most of the things for you, which is what I typically use, although I'm starting to uh, get into some of the settings. Um, one of my requirements for a camera was something that I could transfer directly to my phone. So I didn't have to go through my computer because I actually do all my editing on my phone. I use a Google app so called Snapseed. So between my Sony, I do have a few different lenses. As I've learned from the professional photographer, the lenses are really where it's at and really what cost the big box. So um, I do have a 100 to 400. Um, and I think all my lenses are Sigma. So they're modeled to fit my Sony's. Um, and then I have a micro. Adam. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a um, that's the roadside population. So you're able to get a good, it is. Well, and in Julington Durban, you know, it's mixed in with all that other stuff and you're on that narrow trail. Whereas on the roadside, I'm sure that one was with my 100 to 400. So you can kind of get some space from it. So, yeah. Any other questions? Where would I what? Shop. For like to add to your landscape? So where would you shop for wildflowers is the question. Um, so I would direct you to the Florida Association of Native Nurseries where you can put in, I assume most of you are kind of from Duval and the, the surrounding area. Um, Duval, I'm in Nassau County. So I have, I, I have done native plant landscaping in my own yard and it's been an adventure sourcing. I get a lot from actually Gainesville plant sales. Duval, who do y'all go to? There's rare and uncommon. Okay. Yeah, so Jody said the Ixia. NASA actually has two new native plant nurseries. Um, and I think they both have, have gotten fan certification as well. So you'll find them there. Um, the fan website is plantrealflorida.org and you can put in your zip code and it'll bring up businesses that either sell or uh, do uh, landscaping. Familia Wildflowers, Betsy, do you remember the name of the other one? Okay. Okay, so there's, so the, for the folks on Zoom in Nassau County, it's Amelia Wildflowers and Nassau for Nature, but the Nassau for Nature sounds like she only does pop-ups in like markets. Um, whereas the Amelia's Wildflowers, she is setting up a location and she's also starting to propagate. She's growing fast. So that's a great resource to have in Nassau County. Cause when I started doing my yard, I was, I was driving to Jacksonville, Gainesville, even Green Isle down in central Florida. <laughs> um, so yeah, Adam. And the Ixia Native Plant Society has, do you do it? It's once a year and you got to get there early, get there early, but they have some cool stuff. Well, yeah. But like when they advertise the start time, get there like 15 minutes before the advertised start time. 
That's my tip for you. What's that? So I inherited a yard when I moved in, when I got married, um, moved into his house that was all turf, a huge front yard of nothing but turf. And it did have one dying Asian maple tree or something. Um, so I started small with a few small beds. Um, now I have many large beds and over 60 species represented. Um, I try, most of my stuff can be found in Northeast Florida. I have a few things that I just think are kind of cool. Like I do have some Bricalia, which is uh, more limited in range. Um, but for the most part, I want to kind of build into our native ecosystem. I'm in, like I said, I'm on Amelia Island. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a love, I, I love doing it. It's, um, I've removed the turf manually. So it was a shovel and a wheelbarrow affair, but, um, it's a stress reliever for me. So I love getting out in the garden and digging up dirt, grass, get rid of the turf. Okay. Right, now. right now. Yeah. Yeah. So honestly, this fall, I haven't got out that much, but, but right now you're going to see the Carpheferous and the Liatris. We're kind of getting towards the end, but those are still going Um, the goldenrod. Oh, Betsy, I'm going to put you on the spot for what you're seeing right now. Cause you get out more than I do. Um, The sunflowers. Yeah. Yep. They're just starting for us. Perfect time to see the ghost pipes. They're really easy to find on, on Little Talbot. It's the Big Talbot. Oh, sorry. Thank you. On Big Talbot, it's the last, if you're coming from Amelia Island, so y'all are probably coming from the opposite way, but it's the last little trailhead on Big Talbot before you get to Little Talbot. And they are literally right there at, like you park and you walk in a little bit and there's just like, ghost pipes. So they're easy to find there. But y'all might have other spots. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Have you been doing it over the summer? When did you start it? Okay, so the question is about solarization, which I'm not an expert in by any means. Um, the premise of that is that you kill your grass by putting down clear plastic and it's so hot that it kills the grass, but also the uh, weed seeds. Um, I will say that even when I did the manual removal, um, I have, you know, I've been doing this for about five years now in my yard and I started out doing a lot of weeding, especially because I didn't plant a ton of stuff. It's grown out and receded. So now my beds are pretty full and I'm doing less and less weeding. Um, I think there's no 100% cure. I think no matter what method you use, you're going to do some weeding in the beginning. Betsy has some input though. Hmm. See, we recommend using clear, letting the light in and getting it hotter. But that's what the foundation protocols are. So, yeah. So you could try putting cardboard over that. And because the light will also reduce light will. Yeah, I mean, that would be a similar principle. It would heat it up and reduce the light. So, so similar. but I would also say if you've only been doing it a few months, if you do it in the hottest months, you're probably going to have more reduction of your weed pressure. But it is, it's hard. The other thing too is once you get your plants in and they're grown out, they're going to kind of outcompete some of those weeds. Um, but again, for me, it's just been, I, it, and I, I'm finding less, right? As my plants grow out, as I've been weeding over time, it becomes less intensive. But no matter what you do, you're going to have some weed pressure, I think. Um, Thank you, Emily. Oh. What's up, Adam? <laughs> In my yard? Uh, yeah, so much. Um, lots of different bee species, lots of different wasp species. You know, it's so interesting 
Um, and this is both in natural areas, but when you do it in your yard, you really do have more time to just kind of really observe it. And you learn the food web, right? So I have Passiflora, uh, I have the Incarnata, and I get tons of Gulf fritillaries, and I learn how much wasps like caterpillars. But it's okay, because I have so many caterpillars, and I have a healthy population of wasps, and they don't, they balance each other out, right? That's what you want to see. You want things uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing. So um, I get lots of Gulf fritillary caterpillars, uh, lots probably five or 10 different wasp species, lots of different bees. Um, one thing I found really fascinating was my, I have the tall ironweed, the giant ironweed, and the hummingbirds love it. So that was actually, it grows in front of my office windows. And, and that's kind of how I discovered that was like, these hummingbirds would just come visit it every day. And it makes sense, it's a tubular flower, but it's tiny, right? Cause I also have coral honeysuckle and firebush, which they like as well. Um, birds, we have so many birds. We're lucky that we're next to a, a, a retention pond that like is never going to be built. And our neighborhood has a lot of trees. So bluebirds, all uh, the um, woodpeckers, the big ones. I'm sorry, I'm not a birder. The pileated and then also the littler ones with the red, downy maybe. There's a bunch of those. Um, lots of bluebirds, lots of hawks. I mean, we have the whole kind of bats because we have trees. Um, so yeah, it's really fun to see all the different things visit and utilize the plants. I don't know that plant. Queen of the meadow. Ironweed is a, the genus is Vernonia and there's a, a handful of different Vernonias as well. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with that one. Um, yeah, but uh, one thing I wanted to add to Adam's question was up here in Northeast Florida, when you do native plant gardening, your winter garden can be kind of brown. Um, and so one of the things we're really trying to share with people and really change is that garden aesthetic where when you're in central and especially South Florida, you can have a native plant garden that's green and blooming year round. That's harder to do in Northeast Florida. We do have a few months where especially our wildflowers go dormant, but the stems and the leaves that fall and the seeds are all super important for our wildlife, especially because we do have that dearth of pollen and stuff like that. So our bees overwinter in that leaf litter, um, our moth larva overwinter, um, and we have bees that go into the stems. So I always leave things until uh, I get new growth in the spring. And then I go in and do some clearing. Um, but I've had goldfinches, come through and feed on my seeds. So, you know, really changing that that ethos of gardening to understand that it's okay to have that brown. I mean, seed heads are cool looking. Like, let's start appreciating that winter aesthetic in North Florida too, um, because I get wildlife in winter too, because I leave those things. Thank you. <laughs> And then we're doing a new venue. Oh, we're doing a new venue, uh, the St. John's Botanical Garden and Preserve in Hastings, Florida. Uh, we'll be there on November, what is it, 18th? I can't remember. I'll have to look. Oh, we don't know. We, we're, we're going there to find out. <laughs> it's a private preserve. Yes, Betsy. The... Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Samuel Slu. Yep. Yeah. What? Samuel Slu at U at UNF. Yeah, it's all. Everything is on our website too. So please go to the website. There's also resources for native plant nurseries on there besides Amelia's wildflowers. Um, there are other places where you can get plants. So everybody have a great, happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas. And we'll see you in January. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Got a few minutes. Uh, the website. Yes. Yeah. Since, since, we have, since we have a few uh, minutes extra and they're not rushing us out tonight, um, someone mentioned the website. 
Oh, you. So um, we, we, we have a nice website. It's uh, constantly changing, constantly evolving. Somehow I ended up in charge of it. I don't know how this stuff, I don't know how this stuff happens, but I don't even know how I'm in charge of this, but I am. So, um, it, so for just a few minutes, I just want to show you the, a few key things on the website. Um, I think I can do this. I didn't set it up ahead of time, but I think I can. Okay, so if you if you just do um, do an um, internet search for uh, Exia chapter, right there. So that that's the home page. That's the home page of the of the of the um, website. And um, the, the nice thing about the home page now is um, I have a few shortcuts. So if you want to see the um, if you if you want to see the upcoming um, events, you can click these. So this is the information about our chapter meeting. Um, and if you go on down, here's the uh, our Navy Park work day on Saturday, the right uh, whale festival information and you'll notice that the uh, last uh, sentence has a link to the festival for more information and then here's all the information about our field trip to uh, sawmill slough and then here's the um, uh, uh, link to the uh, st john's botanical garden site uh, again the last sentence here has the um, uh, a link to the to the um, uh, website for for the gardens. So if I, I'm sure most of you probably receive our newsletters, but again, this is pretty much the same information you get in the newsletter. So if you've deleted your email or misplaced it, you can always go to our website and go to uh, the events page. Um, the other uh, really nice part that I added, which um, Jody mentioned, was the... Um, trying to do this by one hand. Resources. Yeah. Right here, uh, local business and nonprofit partners. So if you go to this page, You'll see all of these all of these businesses listed here, or um, members of the Florida Native Plant Society, and Amelia Native Wildflowers. I think someone mentioned Chia Penny's Native Nursery. That is really the closest full fledged Native Nursery we have in Northeast Florida. It's uh, just south of Keystone Heights. I will be there tomorrow. Uh, Florida Florida Wildflower um, Growers Cooperative. They have link. I think they have links to uh, purchase seeds through here. Right, right. Uh, Gnarly Nursery is uh, a backyard nursery of uh, one of our longtime members, uh, Mike Ingram. Uh, Lark Native Plants is a is a new one. Native and Uncommon Plants. That was Leslie Pierpoint's uh, company that she sold to um, um, the. Uh, to um, uh, Alfred, 
and they are converting into more of a grower instead of a, uh, a landscaper. But anyway, here these are these these are all not companies we recommend, but they are partners by joining Florida Native Plant Society, and we do encourage you to support them if you have an opportunity. So it's a nice uh, website. We're we're constantly working on it. I uh, invite you just to spend some time looking at it and uh, looking at all the resources that are available on it. Okay.